Namaste and welcome to episode 18 of Pustakalok, a discussion on the book Decode Your Own Matrix, which is authored by Ms. Lisa Armstrong. Mira Nam Tamasha Kanye here, and I am a radio news presenter at Hinvani. This discussion will be an interaction between Ms. Elisa Armstrong about her book with Dr. B.P. Singh, who is an author and educator. So welcome to you, Ms. Lisa Armstrong, and we can be begin the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm honored and very grateful. Thank you. Dr. P.P. Singh. Namaste to you, Kanye, and the team of Sipiwe, Lisa, Tamasha, Piyush, and Dr. Yogi, and to our online viewers. Again, it's a pleasure to be part of episode 18 of Pustakalok. If uh, I may, Lisa, if I may call you Lisa with your permission, I need to say to you that a special namaskar and welcome to you to this session. Uh, in reading your book, Decoding or Decode Your Own Matrix, it lends very much to the objectives and the principles of this particular program. And hence, it's a pleasure having you here. I want to say at the outset, congratulations on a fantastic piece. It is well written and truly inspirational. And I like the span and the wideness of your writing because it incorporates everyone. And it is broader than the South African society. It is truly international. My interaction with you today will be basically question-based, which is intended to serve as a catalyst to allow you the insight as author to present your thoughts on this book. So they're basically leading by nature. So I'll start off with the first one by saying that, uh, you know, you've documented this piece of writing based on your own life and your experiences. And this puts you in the public eye. So what inspired you to do so? Thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think a lot of people had said to me, you need to start writing about your experiences. Um, and I'm definitely not a writer and I've had no literary training whatsoever. And I'm not even so sure I did very well at English in school. Um, and a friend of mine who um, who's an English teacher kept on saying, you need to write. And so when I was alone at home one day, um, I was asking, um, I was meditating and I was asking what, what do I need to write about? Because I had no idea about what I should write about, um, how to even start doing that. And the message I got was, well, you're not gonna write anything unless you just sit down and start writing. Um, and so I got out my computer and I got onto my bed and I opened it. And all of a sudden, um, I just started writing. And so it definitely wasn't from my conscious mind. It was definitely from a, a different sort of a place. And I just started writing and reading them afterwards. I was seeing that it was pieces of my life that I was sort of accessing. And I didn't really have an analytical reason for what I was writing, but I understand it for myself. It was also a process for me to maybe look back on my life and things that had happened in my life, the way that I perceived them and maybe reframe them in a different way um, and make more sense of them in order to understand where I was in this place in time. Um, so it was very, very interesting because as I wrote, it just sort of flowed and then I wouldn't push it. And then as soon as it would stop, I would stop and then I would continue whenever I felt like I, I needed to write something else with no sort of um, end goal in, in mind. Uh, that actually, uh, exactly the way you phrased your approach now comes through in your writing because it is very, very uh, true and real in terms of a presentation. And that comes through in the way it is communicated to the reader. And in your writing, which you've just explained now, you do use a bit of the flashback technique. You may not have realized it, but that's exactly what you've done. And that's a very uh, strategic form of writing. And what actually makes me admire the book a lot is that while you wrote on factual content, it was a form of a narrative. And I think this is very important to get people to read because sometimes writing factual accounts may not be you know, palatable to everyone. 
But when there's a kind of story and narrative to it, it's so much easier to get your message across and you do that quite well. I need to say that, you know, in all our lives, there are key characters that define who we are and you have many in your book. I'm not gonna ask you about any of them, but I'd like to look at the influence of the humpback whale that you always come back to, that seems to be a kind of home for you. Your, your, your attraction and your feeling that the sea is where you belong comes through very strongly in the book. Could you tell us the significance of the whale to yourself and, and probably to the story as a whole? Yes, I think so. Um, and it's interesting what you say, because you said it feels like um, a place you keep on going back to, that place of feeling of home. And I think that that's exactly what the whales for me and the ocean represented, that feeling of really feeling at home, at peace with who you are and where you are. And I think for me, as I'm sure many people, um, <clears throat> there's aspects of our lives, sometimes it's even our actual families, our friends, those people that we surround ourselves with, but we still don't really feel like we can be exactly who we are. There's still things that we think that we need to say and roles that we need to fulfill and obligations that we have to those around us. Whereas I think the whales for me was the one place and the ocean where I felt no obligation to anybody else. And there was nothing to do, um, nothing to do that I needed to prove my own value to anybody else um, and feel good about myself. It was that one place where I could simply just be in that exact moment and be completely accepted for exactly who I was in that moment. And that feeling of such inner peace and calm um, that came with being around those, those animals, those, those beings. And for me, watching them and spending so much time with them um, and the way that they interacted together, because they're mammals, they breathe. And as far as I understand, and don't quote me on any of the science, but the part of their brain, which feels emotion and connection to one another is relatively four times the size of ours. So they feel connections and emotions far more powerfully than, than we do as human beings. And to see how they interacted as families, as units uh, together, was that, that feeling of unconditional love that I perceived them to have for themselves and for me and that I had for them, um, that you could actually feel. Um, and I think it was that that made me realize that's what I'm looking for. And yes, I'm looking for it in my external world, but being with them and in that sort of energy of just love made me realize that, that that's who I am. If I can feel that within myself, then I have found home. Um, so it was almost like finding within them my home within myself. Um, so it's exactly what you, what you said. And understanding it a little bit further, because I've... Um, done a little bit more studying in terms of sort of consciousness and expanded states of awareness. What I understand is we are all searching for that, that safe womb experience. When we get born into the world, it's, um, it's quite scary. We're going from a safe womb and we, we're coming out um, into this world which feels very strange and difficult and we're fighting for survival to take that first breath of air. So we come into this world um, conditioned to be afraid um, that it's not safe, that we're not good enough, um, that we don't deserve to be loved. All of these things are conditioned into our deep unconscious and subconscious mind. Um, and without knowing it, we're all looking to go back to that place of unconditional love where we are free from fear, where we're free to just simply be ourselves. Um, and that that's all we need to do is go back to being ourselves and feeling our hearts and go back to our hearts and get out of our minds. Um, and for me, that's, I think the whales represent our hearts, feel more and allow ourselves to not fear loving ourselves and loving those around us and loving the world. Then we become free from all of the thoughts um, of fear that we've been conditioned to, which are very deep in our subconscious. So for me, it was definitely almost understanding this concept of um, the ocean and those beings represent the womb as well, where we were safe, aquatic beings, um, whole and complete within ourselves, within our hearts. Um, 
So yes, definitely finding finding our own home in ourselves. Well, uh, Lisa, what resonates with me is the comment you made about when you look into the eye of a whale, you see your soul. And I think that's a very powerful statement. And I wish many of us could have that kind of experience that you speak of, you know. In the right manner, you know, your writing style is unique in simplicity, and that is a very uh, critical thing in writing so that you connect with the reader. However, the content that you deal with is simple in the way you look at everyday life, but you delved into some serious scientific areas when you spoke of portals, you spoke of intentions, of course, from a spirituality point of view, and you spoke of all the scientific terms of the courses, the HQQT courses that you attended to, etc. cetera. Uh, how do you see the relationship between the simplicity of life and the everyday living that we have, and of course, the greater biological scientific experiences you've had through the seminars that you've attended across the world? It's a very good question, actually, because I think on one hand, it is that simple. Um, really, if we were really able to live in the present moment, <clears throat> truly and honestly, and in our heart space, um, and always remembering that, that within that moment, that is all that matters. How you feel there is no past and there is no future. It's only our perception of the past and our worrying about the future um, that makes it real for us. And it course it's a very very real experience because we carry these wounds and, our, and these traumas and these patterns within us so we keep on getting pulled into the past and we keep on getting pulled into the future away from away from just being in our center and our heart space in this present moment um, so the simplicity of that is so profound and yet if anybody is like myself I need to understand everything <laughs> I have a very very curious mind and I can't just accept that truth of like just be in the present moment because there's parts of me pulling myself away from the present moment constantly so for me <clears throat> excuse me my journey was very much into I need to understand more about this um from a sort of like reading and learning as much as I can about how we work as human beings and all the very, very cutting edge science and technology um, in, in, in microbiology and quantum physics and sort of forget about what we've been told is true about science and start looking for new information about what's being discovered now. And what's so beautiful is that if you look at sort of quantum physics microbiology, everything that's being discovered about the human body and the human psyche and the nature of reality itself, neuroscience as well, it's, it almost starts to explain the ancient wisdom that we've read about in so many different ways. And it starts to actually prove scientifically what has been written throughout the millennia in these ancient wisdoms and they start to merge and we start to understand that they're actually the same thing it was just our limitation of what we understood um, you know to be science science is only science in that it's proven it's a proven fact for that moment in time but it doesn't mean that there's not a new truth and a new truth and a new truth. So I think we're in a beautiful time now where, um, where we're starting to be able to really understand the inner workings of the human body and how it connects and how we connect it and how, uh, especially from a neuroscience point of view, how our brains work in order to perceive reality. And for me, if I can understand how I'm perceiving something in my reality as my experience of life, which then has a chemical reaction in my body so that I feel emotions based on um, a thought pattern, which is maybe from the past, then I can learn how I can begin to change my perception of the world. And as soon as I change my perception of the world, then my experience of my life becomes very, very different. Um, and I think as we start understanding these concepts of science and microbiology and neuroscience, we become far more empowered and understand how we can actually use this body, which is the most advanced technology that exists. We've just forgotten how to use it. Um, and we're very limited in the way that we can use it. Um, so I think it's a very, very exciting time to be alive. But again, going back to the simplicity of it, that 
all of that leads to it doesn't really matter whether or not you know all of that stuff or are interested in it. If you go back to heart space, that's where that's where you start to change your life. If you can stop your thought patterns and feel into your heart and feel love, that changes everything. Just that simple fact. Well, I, I think what you've just said will resonate with everyone because you're talking to the reader as a person and the reader is forced to talk to himself or herself as a person. And that, that's actually a sign of very good literature, no matter how you look at it. It's very, very effective. <laughs> But keeping that in mind, you know, the, the serious themes that you've touched on and that you mentioned uh, within the book itself, um, you've got love, you've got fear. Very importantly, you've got self-empowerment, self-capacitation, respect for themselves as well. Together, of course, with other messages such as uh, live in the moment, learn to love yourself, etc. Are there any of these particular ones that you just want to comment on, you know, your themes and your messaging? Yeah, I think, I think for me, um, my journey has definitely been one of um, self love, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I think, um, oh, I think I mentioned in the book, this wonderful teacher of mine called Bruce Lipton, who's a microbiologist, he helped me uh, understand this so much more. Um, in terms of understanding that <clears throat> when we're viewing our reality and the way we perceive our reality, every single thing that we feel and, and perceive in that reality um, is a reflection of our very, very deep subconscious and unconscious beliefs most of the time that we're not aware of. <clears throat> and every single human being comes into this world um, fighting for survival, like I said. Um, and we all have these same very, very deep unconscious and subconscious beliefs that we're not allowed enough, that we need to do something in order to be loved. Um, that we don't deserve love, that we're not good enough. Um, so even though we may be doing very well at our jobs, there's something deep inside, which is still, we're doing the job desperately for seeking love and um, validation outside of ourselves. And so that's why we sometimes get in these patterns where we're not actually living in our joy and living in our hearts, because we feel we need to do these things in order to, to be validated for who we are. And so that self-love really, for me, is the most powerful thing. Because when we start to be able to really love everything about ourselves and stop judging ourselves and heal those parts of ourselves that are need validation from the external world, then we are able to be in our joy all the time, no matter what we're doing. Um, and that's when we are able to love other people so for me i've always been one of these types of people who's needed to fix other people um, <clears throat> and feel like i'm not good enough i actually need to be able able to fix everyone and um that's my perception and that, that's my need so for sort of validation if i can fix somebody i'm of value to everybody else but the reason that i'm doing that if i look deep into my unconscious mind is because i don't feel good enough and i'm also judging that other person, that they need to be fixed. I'm seeing them as incomplete. And that I, with my ego mind, can be the missing piece which completes them. Um, and that's such a great form of judgment of when I perceive somebody else. So when we start to perceive that everybody is perfect, absolutely perfect, exactly how they are right now, um, is when we can really start moving towards that space of unconditional love for one another when we can look at our external world and not get triggered by hurt or grief or pain or frustration or anger within ourselves because when we look at our external world those triggers are showing us that within ourselves we have those wounds which are resonating and it's showing us that within ourselves we're projecting those out into our world and so they affect us deeply <clears throat> and the more healing we do on ourselves and get to that space of, of really loving ourselves, we don't need anything in our external environment to complete us. Um, and then it doesn't matter what we do. And then we are free to choose our greatest joy. What gives us our greatest joy? Not for need for recognition, validation, badges, anything other than that, just because it's simply the most 
beautiful, loving, fun thing that we can think of doing. And if all of us were doing exactly what we wanted to do from a space of complete joy, that's the greatest gift that we can give to the world. Our own healing and following our own hearts is really the greatest gift that we can do to the world. Even if you go to a hairdresser who doesn't really want to be there, and it's just doing it for the money or the need. It's like, that's not a hairdresser you want to go to. Um, if there's a hairdresser who's absolutely passionate about cutting hair and loves the creativity and the artistry about cutting hair, that's the guy you want to go to because he's doing it from a place of love, not obligation, validation, or need for any external return for that. So the self-love really are, are, is... Um, is really something I, I believe is going to change the world and give us acceptance not only of ourselves but of every single other person that we share this beautiful planet with in love and acceptance of everybody on their own journey is exactly where they are supposed to be in this minute right now um, and it might not look like our journey but for them it's exactly where they are and if we can hold that space for everybody to to have their beautiful journeys exactly how they're creating them. Then we get rid of judgment and we get rid of telling that there's only one right way, that there's only one thing to believe. And I really believe it comes down to empowering ourselves to find our own truth, to listen and read and listen to other people's opinions and read the science and read the ancient wisdoms and really, really listen. But at the same time, really feel into your heart what's true for you right now what do you resonate with and that way we start to take our power back um, in terms of every single person has their own truth I can't tell you what you feel I can't tell you what journey anybody else should go on but I really feel it's a it's a journey of, of self-empowerment of going into that place where I have this connection to this innate wisdom within myself I need to listen to that and I can take readings and research and teachings from the external world, but I need to take that into within to my heart and I need to make my own decisions for myself. You know, it, it's very interesting what you've said, because what it brings to my mind is also what you said in the book, and that is the issue of programming. And if I remember correctly, you did say that our programming as people happens up to the age of six. And thereafter we see life through that lens of what we've learned there. This whole issue of deprogramming yourself, which is where we want to be. But in the same vein, the responsibility of us as adults in relation to the young ones that we bring up to the age of six, et cetera. Would you just like to comment on that? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I think a, a lot of people who are reading about this information. So first of all, as I understand it with Bruce Lipton, um, we've got different brainwave states. And um, most of the time we're in our normal level of consciousness, which is usually beta. So we're focused on certain things. Alpha is a little bit lower and slower than that. It's kind of like when you're driving your car. Um, and you're kind of just in that, it's also like a, a meditative state when you're very calm and relaxed, maybe watching the ocean. Theta is a much deeper level of, of brainwave states. And theta is, um, we go through it every morning and every night. So when we're falling asleep and when we're waking up, we pass through the theta brainwave states, which is also called the hypnosis. It's, it's the brainwave state that you go into under hypnosis. Um, it's when you can kind of remember your dreams, but then you forget them. So when you're dreaming, that's a theta brainwave state. And um, up until the age of six, yes, we are literally hypnotized. We're in the theta brainwave state and we are learning and being programmed and conditioned on how to be human, on that we must not, you know, be careful of that and careful of that. And um, money doesn't grow on trees and keep quiet, please. You're not supposed to talk. Um, and all of these deep subconscious programs, which we then go, okay, I must be quiet. I shouldn't say how I feel. Um, I should be afraid. And all of these programs, I also just want to put in, it's like we needed them as human beings in order to stay alive. So we did need to know that we couldn't jump off a cliff and fly. Um, and so we needed that fear um, in order to actually keep us alive to this point. But as our consciousness is expanding 
um, the rest of the fear-based programs and conditioning, we, we don't need anymore um, and we can start to change. And it's a very good question what you say with, with parents with, with um, young children, start then to become very afraid of what are they programming their children with? Um, and you know the, the answer for that, I don't have my own children, so this is my perspective, is that nothing is a mistake and nothing is an accident. And no matter what, we need to be conditioned as human beings in order to survive um, physically in this physical body. And if we can understand that everything is exactly as it should be in its absolute perfection, then the best thing that we can do for youngsters and for children um, is fully embody the love ourselves. So there's a very, very deep sense that we all have as human beings of this obligation to others. <clears throat> when we do things out of obligation to fix, to help, to, um, to do these things, they come from a need to change an external reality. Um, we want to meddle in the external world because it doesn't to change it. And that's not coming from a, a place really of accepting absolutely everything. And so I've often had these discussions and workshops with, with parents. And they're like, what can I do about my daughter? I don't know if I'm programming her the wrong way. Um, and how's this going to affect her? Is first of all, to know that it's in its absolute perfection and know that, that there was a reason that that particular child cho chose you as a mother. Um, it's really not an accident. Um, for all that you are as that mother. And the best that we can do for our children is to be living examples of what it means to completely love and accept ourselves and to remain and follow our hearts into that place of joy. Because when a mother is doing that, then that is a living example to that child that that's what they have permission to do. Um, and from the mother's point of view, that would be the ultimate acceptance of that child, um, no matter what that child's journey looked like, in loving it and not judging that child's journey. Um, and so I really believe that for everything, actually, if we go back to that, especially when it comes to our loved ones and our families, that's when we start to be more involved in what we think they should be, what we wish they had been, um, how we want it to be different from what it is. And that's just from our own um, lack within ourselves and wanting something to be different outside of ourselves, but going into that place or trying and going, striving to that place of loving ourselves and going back to what is my ultimate truth is, is really an example that we can, can leave for younger people, giving them permission to be whoever they need to be and to walk this beautiful journey of life in its absolute perfection, even though we might look at it and think that it's not correct, but that's just a judgment. So um, it comes to the place of accepting that it's all perfect. Well, you know, your, your, your explanation reminds me of a very well cited phrase by the great Mahatma Gandhi, who said, be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. And I think if the parents can be that kind of role model to the children, they'd actually be living out exactly what you've said. Uh, Lisa, I just want to go back a little bit to the messaging that you have in the book, you know? And you use some analogies and some experiences that, that carry great weight. I'm just going to mention a few to them. I'd just like your thoughts on them for the benefit of our readers. Uh, you had an incident where some fishermen caught a manta ray which was the food for the day. And yourself and Bamboo, that was your helper, came across this and you managed to persuade them to let go of their food, their sustenance. And the reason given to you thereafter as to how Bamboo got them to do uh, that very great deed or grave deed was really of interest to me. Would you like to explain that to our readers? Yes, sure. Even when you um, even when you talk about that, I've got goosebumps through my whole body. Um, um, yeah, for me, it was such a huge life lesson because for me, being a, um, working in the diving industry, the mantas were important, and you know we needed to save them. And these fishermen had caught one, and um, you know it was it was traumatic for me 
because I love the mantas. But when I saw the whole thing playing out, it was like that was the food for those people, for the entire village, that was the food. Um, and Bumbo trying to um, negotiate with them. And I asked him, how did you, how did you get them to let it go? And um, he said, well, because I was like distraught after we let the man to go. And then I saw all of these women on the beach with their buckets waiting for their food. <clears throat> um, and I suddenly was so confused because it was like, how, how does this work? How can we, how can we change the way the world is? Because we're trying to save one thing and yet there's a chain reaction here where you start to understand that how you view the world and what's good and what's bad and what's right and what's wrong is just through your perception because you haven't seen a greater picture. The intention behind those fishermen of catching the mantis was for the benefit of an entire village. So it was coming from a place of love. Um, and you start to change the way you judge the external world and you start to question, where do you get your perception of right and wrong from? Um, because when you look behind somebody's intention, you're perceiving through your own judgments. But when you look at maybe why people do things and how things are in the world and understand um, that there's, there's the way you might perceive an action might be right or wrong or good or bad, but if you are in those people's shoes, um, you can only be in those people's shoes to understand that their intentions are actually coming from a place of love when you judged it to be not from a place of love. And that experience um, with Bumbo offering to give his goats to the fishermen in the village for that day so that they would release the manta because they just needed food and he had goats really brought to light um, our Western culture of accumulating things for need to feel better, chasing things, and not to say that it's not good to have things, but I feel that as a culture in the West, we've come to, or not even, we've come to, to use things and um, accumulation of things, whether it's titles, achievements, um, material things to validate who we are because ultimately we're searching for to feel better about ourselves we're searching to feel good about ourselves we're searching for a feeling of feeling validated and enough so we grasp around in the external world to feel that whereas if you look at the world as a whole there are more than enough natural resources to feed the entire planet um, there really are these new forms of energy technology that are coming out so when you look at what is the solution for the world, it's all, I feel, coming back to love and, and the sense of the sense of oneness versus separation. Because we're all coming from a place of fear, we tend to put walls up around our hearts, around our homes, fences around our homes, and identify with smaller and smaller groups of people who think exactly the same as we do in order to feel safe in this world that doesn't feel safe. And that means collecting the last bit of food for ourselves so that we are okay. <clears throat> it means this idea of saving up enough stuff so that when we get older, we're okay. And that's all fear-based stuff. Um, it's all very, very fear-based. And so we separate ourselves into smaller and smaller groups and um, put walls between those who think differently or live differently than us because we are actually afraid of them because we just want to feel safe. So it all becomes smaller and smaller and more separate from one another. Where underneath all of that, we all want the same thing. We all want love. We all want to feel safe. Um, and that comes from within all of us. And if we start, start seeing ourselves more as whole and all looking for the same thing in different ways, then we start changing the world and we stop acting from a place of fear and accumulation and scarcity. We've been programmed to think that there's not enough. 
it's a deep, deep conditioning and it's a survival mechanism. So if we're always thinking that there's never enough and we're using the last things before somebody else can get it and saving up um, so that we'll be okay um, or being the first, because unless you're first in something, then, then you're no good. It's all of the survival pitting us each against each other, which is just a conditioning in the mind. Um, and once we start to see that beyond that illusion, that we are all, all separate. There is no fear. The fear is a complete fabrication of our conditioning. Um, and as we feel and act from a place of fear, then we create it and perceive it in our world. Whereas if we all start living together, um, each person following their greatest joy, we all fit perfectly together. Um, and what has come into my awareness so much is like, okay, well, what is the solution for the world? How do we go from where we are into a different way of being? And I honestly believe that it's already happening. Um, as we start to let go of this fear and start to heal the wounds that this fear has created within every single one of us, um, we start to become more open and to perceive new ways of being in the world. There's new ways of growing food um, there's new uh, energy technologies um, from quantum. In, in uh, Greg Braden is a beautiful person, and it's it's if you can extract the energy from the square centimeter of space, it's enough energy to power the entire planet for the next thousand or million years. I can't remember what his thing was in in this much space, and so all of these technologies are coming they're evolving they're being born right now new ways of growing food which is completely organic in alignment with with the flow of 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 our planet in which we live changing the structure of the water all of these things are coming and so for me that was profound because it's it's it changed my perspective and made me understand that we're all the same and we're all looking we're all looking for the same thing, ultimately. Thanks, uh, Lisa. You know, to continue from, from what you just said to us now, and I think this will be of great interest to the, re, uh, the listenership and the viewership. You've had a number of inexplicable experiences in this time that you've begun your QHHT uh, training and the path that you've chosen. I'm just going to mention two, and I'd like you to comment on them. The first was the accident that you avoided by having a flat tire when you left one of your workshops with a colleague. And the second in, in Teos, where you met the guy named John and his dog that had a wound on its back that was inexplicably sorted. Would you just like to take us through those two experiences of yours? Yeah. <clears throat> um... So I think, you know, everything is about perception. And you mention um, driving along the road and getting a flat tire and thinking the first thought you think is like, oh my goodness, this is all going wrong. That's our first thought because we have a perception of a way in which something is going wrong or going right. So we're judging. Um, and for me, it was very, very profound because after having that thought and fixing the tire and continuing, literally seeing two kilometers down the road, there was a huge accident in exactly the lane that we were going. And I got goosebumps all over my body. And it was like, wow, um, it's just a perception. And our perception is conditioned from, from a pattern which repeats itself in our lives over and over again about when something's going wrong and when something's going right. Um, and that's happened a number of times to me. That, and it shows me how limited our perception of our life is because we can only see what we see in front of us. And what we see in front of us, neuroscience has shown us, is a guess. The brain guesses based on the past, what you are experiencing and what you're actually seeing. So what we see is not real. The brain makes up based on our past and therefore our past is based on what we believe is possible. And our brain then perceives and projects that into a reality of what we see we're pretty much always seeing the past and we're seeing what we believe to be possible and what we believe not to be possible. We don't see because it's outside of our perception. Um, and it's happened to me a number of times. Um, and the example that you mentioned about the dog, 
it's now being proven from a quantum physics neuroscience every single facet of science biology is showing that the healing the the disease within our body um, is just a manifestation of something we're not seeing of a very deeply suppressed emotion um, which manifests in listen to it it's we've been told don't get angry don't cry um, um, that's not good to do so we suppress grief anger shame resentment into our body and we think we're okay but we've suppressed those emotions and we're not aware that we're carrying them forward in our lives and when we don't listen um, to this greater intelligence that we all change our lives um, or to do things differently, eventually these suppressed emotions in our body start to create dis-ease. Um, and if you look at the work of Joe Dispenza, um, he's just scientifically proven that there is a different protein in the blood of advanced meditators. He's literally just scientifically proven um, taking, taking a, a virus, and taking the blood of an advanced meditator and putting it into the virus, it kills the virus. And then he did the same thing with cancer cells. He took cancer cells from somebody who had cancer and he took the blood from an advanced meditator and put it into the cancer cells and it killed the cancer immediately. Um, and so this is just, science is now backing up what we believe to be impossible, what we believe, magic and mystery, all that mystical stuff. It's not really. Science is now proving it to be an absolute certainty, um, which is beautiful for me because I have this mind, which is like, I don't understand this stuff. So if I can workings of the human body more um, and the neuroscience and the body and how it works, it's not magic. It simply becomes an understanding possible for things to happen, which we previously thought to be impossible. And I think one of the questions you had was, um, and I'm being shown it all the time, we're just so attached to the way things should be based on the past that all we do is we project the same pattern over and over again. And if we can start doing things differently, and meditation is really one of the most powerful ways to do that, is we start to access, and, and just a little bit of science about this, is like everything that we believe that we are um, is a series of patterns which is held in a brain, a part of the brain called the default mode network. It's one part of the brain which contains all of our patterns, um, and that's what we use in our conscious mind. It's a default mode network. It's the way that we then perceive our world. Um, and when we meditate or when we do a lot of different things like that, we actually um, suppress or we allow that default network to go to sleep. Um, and then we start to be able to perceive realities beyond the default mode network, which is just a copy and paste from the patterns of the past projecting into our future. And when we do these things and allow these things, we start to open our perspective to allow our brain to see things and experience things that we didn't think were previously possible. Um, and this way, and we call it magic and we call it the mystical experiences, um, but this is actually real. And science is now proving that it's absolutely real. Um, once we can start to get out of our patterns um, and start to do new things. But like I said before, it's, it's sometimes we feel a lot of fear doing things that we are not used to doing in the past because everything in our body wants to keep us in those same patterns of a reality which we understand to be the truth. Lisa, just, just to continue your, your thought process there. there. There's life lessons to be learned on reorientating our lives as we go forward here after, you know, you allude to the Great Awakening, which we'll speak about just now. I just want to read three extracts from your book. Uh, and then, of course, for you to comment thereafter. The first is, it is only when we can truly take absolute accountability for everything in our external world as a reflection of our internal, that can we then use our external world as a map of how to unprogram ourselves. The second one I'd like to read is, 
you mentioned when you refer to the matrix of illusion. To quote, you say, I had just stepped through the doorway of the matrix of illusion in which I had been living, perceiving and experiencing my reality. The third one is, everyone is capable of effectively reprogramming our minds more in line with our true self and that which we wish to experience. We are learning to become creators. In tandem with these three extracts that I just read, I want to ask you the title of your book. It's called Decode Your Own Matrix, and I hold it here. All these three extracts inform and are contained in this title that you have. Would you just like to take us through your thought process when you decided on the title of this book? Yes. Um, I think for me, this entire journey in the book, um, as you said, it's um, the way that it was written is my journey in starting to suddenly understand that the reality in which I was living um, didn't have to be like that. All the pain and suffering that I felt within myself, I didn't have to experience anymore. I could start this process of healing myself and therefore start to perceive a different reality. Um, and it was this complete awareness of combining all of my research into science and um, all of my experience in quantum healing hypnosis and starting to understand as my clients would have instantaneous healing because they were in this space where they were um, out of their default mode network and they were able to see different realities beyond the perception of the very narrow and lim limited um, part of their of their of who they thought they were um, and I think science is just proving and ancient wisdoms have always said that we are greater than who we believe we are um, who we believe we are our identity our personality everything is actually our greatest limitation um, but we're so attached to it because we need to feel important and we need a purpose and we need to feel validated. Um, but that's what's causing us the most pain in this world is this attachment to these parts of ourselves, which no matter what we do in our external reality, it, it never quite feels whole. Um, and going back to what you said of deprogramming, I would say probably it's a little bit it is about deprogramming. It's starting to understand our external reality. If we can be that empowered that we can understand that we are always creating the perception of our lives and therefore the experience of our lives. So the perception of our lives becomes the actual experience. And so absolutely it is real because your body um, is feeling those emotions of the external reality mirrored back to you. You're feeling the pain, the grief, the joy, whatever it is. Um, but if we understand that we're actually projecting that as our external reality, and we empower ourselves to know that we are not victims of the external world, we are actually creating the perception of the external world and looking into science and everything, like I said, is starting to prove that now. Then we become, that's the first step for me, it was the first step. It's very, very easy to blame our parents, our partners, um, those people that trigger us. Our natural reaction is to go, it's you, it's you, it's you. Um, and the same way that we perceive the, the external world as a whole, it's this situation that's because of that. And so we stay in a perpetual victimhood of the fact that we can't change our, our lives. Um, and we wait for somebody else to come along and change the, our lives for us or save us or fix us. So we sit in perpetual waiting for something to come along. Um, but within every single one of us exists this immense power, this immense power. We've just been conditioned not to understand or know that we have it within us. Um, and once we understand that everything we are projecting into our external world is a projection of our own conditioning, we can start to let go of that and start to perceive realities way beyond what we can even imagine and literally shift trajectories in our life instantaneously by understanding how a program is per perpetuating. And like you said, do you have any more examples of, um, of this magic and mystery that, that you've experienced, like with the healed dog? Um, and you know, the greatest way that I've experienced this journey is in 
the relationships in my life. You know, we all kind of blame our parents for something, you know, um, and we all have this, this weird relationship. And if, if we don't blame them, then we usually project that then onto a partner. And so we always feel these, it's the same patterns of um, not being loved for who we are, but that's only coming from within us because we don't feel that we love ourselves. And my relationships have shifted completely to the point where I'm now remembering a different past before all I used to remember how my mother didn't love me enough and my father didn't accept me. Um, and that was deep pain. And that carried on throughout my life until I realized like I'm doing this. How am I projecting this? Why am I still experiencing this, this grief? Um, and once I start healing my own wounds and starting to understand that it's me who doesn't love me, all of a sudden I start to experience two very different parents in my life. Um, because I've healed the way that I've perceived them. Um, and instead of wanting them and needing them to be something else for me, I start loving and accept accepting them for exactly who they are. And then that gets reciprocated and they start loving and accepting me for who I am. So science, neuroscience, everything, quantum physics is now starting to explain that everything we perceive is an illusion. Bruce Lipton explains it perfectly. He explains that we, our brain receives 400 billion bits of information per second. 400 billion bits of information per second. And our brain takes that and it filters it according to our conditioning, our limited beliefs, our wounds. And it takes what we believe to be true. I don't love myself. I'm not good enough. The world is a scary place. And then we project and see those filtered beliefs in our external world. And that's 2,000 bits of information. 2,000 bits of information out of a potential of 400 billion bits of information becomes the reality we perceive and it's in a very real way as our life and who we are. So as you start to understand this and as we start to do our own healing, instantaneously you can start to perceive and that different 2000 bits of information of reality as your life and that's how powerful we are and we alone have have the power within us to be able to do that and it starts by starting to understand that the way we perceive the world is mostly through our own wounding and once we start healing ourselves and understand that we do need this healing and coming back to this place of love we start to perceive the changes very, very quickly in our external world. Wow, Lisa, that, that, that was a great summation of, of our discussion and of your book. But I just want to say that to sum up what you've said from my point of view, we are the architects of our own perspectives from what you explained and therefore our own destinies. Now, Lisa, uh, I can't let you go without asking you this very question. And that is about our very favorite and lovable topic, the pandemic. Your writing extended into this period. And you've referred to the pandemic as the great awakening, uh, the shift, the dawn of the golden age, the age of Aquarius, even the apocalypse. Just elaborate on that for us, please. Sorry, can you repeat that question, the last question? Yeah, you have many names for the current pandemic from the perspective you employ in life. You know, like the Great Awakening, you've called it, uh, the shift, the dawn of the Golden Age, the Age of Aquarius, and even the Apocalypse. Uh, for the purpose of our readers who all have an interest in that particular topic, uh, just some comments on that, please. Mm. Um, you know, the way that I perceive this, and again, um, it's my perception, um, is I kind of drew a parallel to what was happening with the, the lockdown and the, 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 the everything, the pandemic, um, together with what had happened, which started my journey, um, which was the complete destruction of my business and my life and my home with a cyclone almost exactly five years ago. Um, and it was... When I sat down and thought, oh my goodness, I've just lost everything. This is the worst day of my life. And then I was like, hang on. 
what if it's just something I can't see right now? What if I already changed my perception right now? Somehow, in a way that I don't see yet, this is the best day of my life. And if I just believe that and feel that feeling of like, somehow this is the best day of my life. From that place that that happened and I decided to make that very, very simple decision. Um, in a place of having lost everything, lost everything that I'd worked for my whole life through blood, sweat and tears. Um, obviously one would perceive that to be terrible, but in changing my perspective to go somehow, this is happening absolutely perfectly. It's in my highest purpose and it's the best day of my life. That set a course of events, which then made that perception true. It was miracle after miracle after miracle of being able to rebuild that business and finally sell it and start off on a different journey. And now when I look back at that time, I'm like, thank goodness for the cyclone that destroyed everything that I own because it set me free from my very limited version of who I believed that I was. It set me free from the prison of my mind, which was fearful to step into the unknown and change my life and experience new things because I was so attached to a need for validation and need for purpose. Who are you when you don't have any reason to wake up in the morning? Who are you when you've lost everything? And this feeling of not that anybody needs to do it, because again, this is a pattern. This feeling of like freedom when you feel you have nothing left to lose. Because it is that which we fear losing, which holds us a prisoner to hoarding it and keeping it and staying very, very small. And not to say that we should lose everything because that's a pattern. But already, if we understand this concept of like, if you can feel as though you've got nothing to lose. It's like this fear of losing that makes us hoard and be very fearful about stepping into the unknown and taking risks into new directions and becoming new versions of ourselves and doing things out of the pattern. It's that fear. and It feels like fear when we step out into the unknown, but it is only in the place of the unknown that we create a new way of being, that we create a new path for ourselves. And so I drew that to the pandemic is literally got the world and shaken it upside down. Um, it's, it's a complete destruction for lack of a better word of everything we've known to be true. Five years ago, we were making five year, 10 year, 15 plans, 15 year plans and projecting them into the future, um, staying in one pattern. And so that's going to be your life. You're going to live the same day over and over again. Um, it might be with a different relationship or a different job, but the same pattern is going to play out until the day you die. It's just going to look different. You're going to, it's a pattern. Uh, that's why people are like, I don't understand why well, I'm still dating the same person. It's just like, it's, it's a pattern. You can break up with that destructive relationship and you'll find another one straight away because it's your wound, which keeps on attracting that same pattern back into your life. So it looks different, but, um, and now we're in a place where we're like, it's very difficult to project the next five years. We're in the complete space of the unknown right now. And instead of it's terrifying. Because every part of ourselves and our pattern and our conditioning wants to know what its life is going to look like until the day we die. Um, but now we're in the space of we have no idea. And it is only in the unknown that we are going to, as a, a world, start to look at new ways of doing things. We've been set free, if you like, in very traumatic way. And it's been very traumatic for a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people have experienced a great degree of loss of a lot with love and compassion for everything that's going on in the world right now and how we are all experiencing this. It's a deep sense of bringing out this absolute fear and loss of the way that the world was. But on the other side of that, there's a new way that the world can be and is being and is being born right now. It's a new way from a place of community and love rather than separation and fear. Um, and this transition that we're going through is going to play out differently for all of us, depending on how much we cling to this old need of self-validation and for the fear and all the walls that we want to be able to protect ourselves against 
everybody and everything else in our external reality. And once we realize we are our external reality, that sets us completely free to be able to already start to create from that place where we understand that there's nothing to fear, even though we go through phases of fearing, of fear, as we step into greater degrees of unknown, it is only in the unknown that we are going to create a new way to come together as an incredible way to live together um, from a place of love. And so that really, for me, um, is what I've felt and what I've experienced during this pandemic. And um, everybody is being, I think, asked that same question of what's important to you? If you, if you just stop for a minute um, and all of this busyness and running from, from one sense of achievement to the next, to the next, to the next, social engagements, all of these things that we take from our external world to try and make us feel good about ourselves, but which is a perpetual need to chase after things. We just take a minute and come back to within ourselves and ask ourselves, what is really important? It can be seen as the greatest gift. Now is the potential that we have, like with me with the lodge, when I lost that, it took it took that to actually happen, to actually push me out of my comfort zone, to start a new life and a new trajectory. And since that happened, I've traveled the world. I've met the most incredible people. I've um, just experienced nothing in my life that I ever believed that would be possible to experience, all from a tragedy um, of losing everything that I owned and my entire sense of who I was and my identity and my purpose and my validation for being here on this planet. Um, and now the way that I view things that happen is doesn't matter what happens to you. If in that moment, feel the grief, feel the pain, because it does come, it's very real. It's been buried and suppressed for our entire lifetimes. And it's okay to feel it. And it's okay not to be okay right now because we are literally saying goodbye to a version of ourselves, the very limited version of ourselves, born of fear, and we are birthing a new version of ourselves, an expansive version of ourselves based in love. And so for me, it's to hold all of us, each of us in love and compassion, because this is not easy. It's the most difficult thing to do, to let go of a part, this part of who we believe that we are and our understanding of how things are and this need for safety. And to go through this process all in our different ways of, of holding each other on this journey um, so that we can really birth an incredible, an incredible earth, the one that feels right in the heart. But that starts within every one of us as soon as we start to heal ourselves um, and living from a place of love. Um, we start to perceive a new world. We start to perceive a new reality um, based of love, based in love. In essence, I think uh, what you've said is that although we as a world, in a world community, the global community, are in a very bad space at this point in time in terms of the pandemic, the message that your book gives is there is hope. And that hope lies within us and the way in which we interact with the world today. So it has something to offer everyone. And I think that's what makes this a good piece of literature. Lisa, the last question I have for you is, do you have any comments or any remarks that you'd like to make in summation, something I may not have touched on? Um... No, I don't think so. Um, I think I think your summary of everything has just beautifully summed it up. That no matter how difficult this is, this this process that we're going through right now, the situation that we're going through, um, it is a it's, it's a rebirthing of something new, a new version of ourselves. Um, and sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but that's okay. Um, but really for me, and it's what I do all the time now, is whenever I'm feeling a sense of this is all going wrong, just literally straight away, take a few deep breaths and know that it's all going right. And as soon as you change that perception, you start to see a new potential, a new road and a new trajectory of your life in that simple, 
shift in perspective. And that's how we start creating a new life for ourselves is from changing our perception to know that everything is going perfectly. And it's such a sense of relief, really, when you can can feel that and go back into that um, that space. Um, but not to discount the fact that that the shifts that are happening in the world are scary because it's changing and we don't like change. <clears throat> we like comfort zones and we like to know what's going on. Um, but letting go of the need to know um, and really going down to what gives you the greatest joy. What gives you the greatest joy? And just do that for now. <clears throat> um, really just do that for now, even if it's growing a flower or a plant or, or just do anything that takes you back to that moment now because nothing else scientifically exists and it's been proven now. There's no future and there's no past. There's only our perception of it and that's what creates all the fear and the anxiety and the worry. So coming back to that moment right now is the only thing that's actually real. And we are completely empowered to feel exactly how we want to in this moment. So do anything that makes you feel okay in this moment. Um, and from that place, you will change your life. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here today and to, to share with all of you beautiful people. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. I just want to say to you that we see you exactly where you are supposed to be, right in front of a portrait or a painting that depicts the sea, intentional <laughs> or otherwise. <laughs> you know, good literature contributes to conscientizing society and in this way, improving the lives of people, especially intrinsically. And, and your book gives us hope in that space. Mm -hmm. Decode Your Own Matrix is educational, it's empowering, and it ultimately results in the capacitation of the reader. Uh, every reader takes something away from it. We're inspired to look at our very own lives for guidance as compared to looking externally. And it leaves us with some form of a change, which is a hallmark of good writing and literature. So congratulations to you once again on an excellent piece and on an excellent experience of your life that you can share with us. I want to thank you for your contribution to the greater bodies of knowledge, because that is where your book is actually placed. And we need to be reminded that we have and we hold the power of our own liberation and growth within our very selves. And thank you for making us see exactly how we can actually harness that power. We wish you all the best with this masterpiece of a work and a fantastic future for yourself. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. If I may, Dr. B.P. Singh, I just want to ask Lisa one question. Um, as the host, I'd like to just formally thank you for all of this insightful knowledge. I didn't think I would be writing notes. I hope it doesn't show too much on the screen. I've been writing so many notes. I found this uh, quite incredible. So thank you so much for your existence and, and for this, this, this discussion. Um, I'm sure that a lot of the people who will be watching will be very inspired by it. And for those who are curious to learn more about you and your book, where can they access you? Where can they find you? Uh, thank you, Tamosha. Um, um, the, the, the easiest way is my website, um, which is www.lisa-armstrong.com. Um, so everything, ways to access the books are on there. Um, I've got uh, links to all of my social media where I post insights often, every day almost, um, and obviously a way to get in touch um, as well if there were questions or anything. Um, and, and a lot of different practices that I offer, like the breathwork online, which is amazing. It's, it's transforming. It's really, for me, been a way to be able to see what I can't see. Um, to, to just use my breath, which is nothing external to me. It's just changing the way we breathe in a certain way to access beyond the patterns of who we believe we are and um, receive great, great um, uh, universal knowledge and wisdom. Um, you know, every single question that we have about our lives can be answered from ourselves <clears throat> if we just get out of our mind. And so this practice for me has become what resonates with me the most, because it's not me telling anybody anything. 
it's allowing a space for others to find their own truth um, and to become fully empowered and to be able to learn to access that whenever they want to in terms of um, <clears throat> guidance for their, their life purpose, next steps to take, wounds that need to be healed. And so um, that, that will be my next step, I think. Um, BP was asking me where to from here. And for me, that's become a very, a very, um, a way that resonates with me the most is to be able to create an online platform so people can do it at home, wherever they are in the world, um, to breathe together, to access this expanded state of awareness where they, um, it can be very, very transformational to receive and start to connect with this, what we call our inner wisdom, our intuition, our inner guiding intelligence, whatever you want to call that, um, guiding us to our greatest joy um, and back to the place of the healed heart. And so um, thank you so much for the opportunity to spread that to people because I'd love to share that with as many people as possible. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. And uh, so we'll now be having our vote of thanks by Mr. Sipiwa Mkunu from the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India, Durban, South Africa. Over to you, Sipiwa Ji. Namaskar and greetings to all of you. On behalf of Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, I am honored today to deliver a vote of thanks on today's episode 18 of the program Booster Calog. Today's discussions was on a book, Decode Your Own Matrix, authored by Miss Lisa Armstrong. Now allow me to thank our online guests who participated this evening. Firstly, I will start with Lisa, uh, Miss Lisa Armstrong, who is the author of this wonderful book, called Decode Your Own Matrix, who had a very wonderful interactions with Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, an author and educator. To these two wonderful souls, allow me to say Danyaba, thank you very much. You know, I'm like speechless. I got more, nothing more to say because it, to me, it was like I was, I was, I was in, in the class learning about the spirituality. You know, I was like saying inside me, I was saying, whoa, 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 whoa. So <laughs> even now also to Lisa G, I'm saying to you, thank you very much, ma'am. We, we learned, you know, so there are so many things that you, you, you told us and we learned so many things, even that after the natural disaster struck you, you were flattened, but you rose back like a phoenix. That disaster pushed you to the correct destination. Now I believe where you are, according to you, where you are now at this point in time, you are happy, we are better than before. So you didn't know what the unseen was doing, but now you fully understand what God was doing. So in us also, there were times, there are times that will come where we will not understand what the Almighty is doing. But after everything, we will understand. Once the dust settles, we understand, oh, there was a reason for this. There was a season for this. So to Lisa Armstrong, GMM, thank you very much. That's why I'm saying I have nothing more to say. To Dr. B.P. Singh Ji also say Danyavat for conducting. You know, when people are attending the spiritual classes, they come out soft, they, no argument. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm in that position whereby I learned, learned, learned. So questions are with me, you know, to, 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 to understand what uh, Lisa Ji was saying, to really understand who I am, you know, who owns me. What I am in the right space for my destination. More things are coming to my life to push me what the Almighty wants from me. From me, those are the questions that Lisa G. I'm I'm gonna ask myself after this recording. I'm hoping PG is, is gonna edit this thing out. But lot you left lot of questions in me where I have to ask myself. I'm in the right space. 
or oh, God through his miracle will put me in the correct platform for me, where I will find and understand myself, where I'm going, what I'm doing, what I'm gonna do. I believe after this lecture, I'll call it a lecture, Lisa G, I'll find my direction. So thank you, ma'am. I'm showing these are my signs of appreciation to say thank you very much to you. Thank you very much to Dr. Bhuvan Prakas G. We really enjoyed, we really uh, appreciate the entire interactions, you know. So to both, thank you very much. This is thank you, Dr. Singh. To director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi. Ms. Tamasha Kanye, our program director. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Piyush Kandelwal, thank you, sir. To all our online participants who took part on today's program, Danyavat for taking part on today's program. For more information on Swami Vivekananda Kacharat Center in Devon, please visit ICCR in Devon. Once again, to Lisa Armstrong G and Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh G, thank you very much. To all of you, have a wonderful evening. Namaskar.